This 20-year-old soldier in the U.S. Army sits in this police cruiser, somewhat confused. He had just returned home after a three-week training camp. Only shortly after he returned home, his wife was found dead. How could this have possibly happened? We would like to send our condolences to the family and loved ones of Danielle Nimitz. Nineteen-year-old Daniel Nemitz was the kind of person that would walk into a room and instantly gain the attention of people. The good-looking young woman was an avid cheerleader and she was made to be a flyer. A flyer in cheerleading is the athlete who is lifted into the air during a stunt and is on top of the stunt or pyramid. This was so fitting because of her tiny frame and her dream to soar to new heights. Many would compare her to a small stick of dynamite, loud and full of energy. Danielle was a happy, joyful, and compassionate young woman. Everyone she encountered felt her enormous heartfelt warmth and beautiful smile. While cheerleading in a high school football game in Northern California in October of 2012, she met a boy by the name of Skyler Nemitz. When they met, there was instant chemistry. Right after they met, Danielle began seriously dating Skyler a recent high school graduate who had just joined the army and was leaving soon to begin his basic military training in Georgia. Just three months later, during his Christmas break, Skyler brought Danielle a diamond ring and proposed to her on the top of Neyland Mountain. Fast forward another three months to March of 2013 and Skyler Nemitz graduated from boot camp in Georgia. The same day he graduated, the young couple went to the courthouse and were officially married. They settled into an off-base housing in Lakewood, Washington, near Fort Lewis, where Skyler was stationed. The couple had a lot in common and enjoyed guns and went shooting together often. Skyler claims it was something Danielle especially enjoyed because it meant spending time with him when he wasn't away for weeks on end during military training missions. He even built Danielle a custom AR-15 for her 19th birthday in her favorite color, blue. Skyler Nemitz grew up around guns and fired his very first rifle when he was just a kid. A collector and builder of weapons, Skyler kept over a dozen guns in the apartment he shared with his wife, Danielle. From the outside, they looked like the perfect couple, but behind closed doors, that wasn't always the case. Danielle would quite often catch up with her friends while Skyler was away for army-related duties. This was because Skyler didn't particularly like Danielle catching up with her friends while he was back in town. If Skyler went to visit his friends, however, he would leave Danielle at his parents' house while he visited his friends alone. James Peltier, who had been a father figure to Danielle growing up, said, I met him on three occasions and I think I shook his hand and then he just went back to his car and left. Skyler made no effort to form any connection with the people closest to Danielle, and her friends began to notice. Skyler would also put pressure on Danielle to make sure the house was spotless for when he arrived back home advising her to not leave a single mark on the carpet. September 27, 2014, the infantry soldier left on another mission in eastern Washington for three weeks of battlefield training. While Skyler Nemitz was away, he texted Danielle asking her to buy him a bottle of Sailor Jerry's and a bottle of Fireball so that Skyler, who was underage, could enjoy them when he got home. It was an odd request, but Danielle obliged. October 16, 2014, on the day Skyler Nemitz was returning home, Daniel video chatted with her best friend Michaela Yingling that morning, saying that she couldn't wait for him to get back. Later that night with Skyler home, Daniel video chatted with Michaela again. Michaela noted that she was sitting at a computer desk. Skyler was in the background, on the couch. She then ran over to him and jumped on his lap and was acting all happy that he was home. Michaela couldn't help but feel the emotion that Daniel displayed was not genuine. Despite this, Daniel and Michaela said their goodbyes to each other and hung up the phone. But that would be the last time the two would ever speak. 911, what are you reporting? Hi, uh, I think somebody was shot, our neighbors. Uh, we heard a lot of bang and our neighbors were making a lot of noise. I didn't want to check. He said, he said his rifle was out and there was an accident. He said her name is Danielle. Uh, Danielle was the one that shot and he accidentally shot her? I don't, I don't know that part. We just heard the gun go off and he said there's an accident. Okay, is she breathing at all? Is she breathing? 
Is she breathing? No. No. And you said you don't know his name? No, I don't. Can you ask him his name? What's your name? Tyler. You hear someone screaming? Um, I, I was, I'm their neighbor, and I heard a shot um, go off, and I wasn't sure if it was shot or anything else. Um, uh, the husband had said that she's dead, and he doesn't want me going in to see her. Uh, it was a, it was a accidental discharge because the, the round was in a right in a rifle. So the male told you that his wife is dead. Yes. Okay. So she accidentally shot herself. Is that correct? Or what you've been told? Uh, anyway? The, the husband does not want to talk about it, uh, okay. um, so we just need somebody here. Yeah, we have, we have we been notified at some like from somebody else. Um, do you guys know where that rifle is that, now at all? I didn't ask. Skyler had told the neighbors that she had shot herself while cleaning the gun, but quickly changed his story to an accidental discharge. Police quickly arrived and took Skyler into custody while they investigated the scene. They found Danielle at the computer where she made the phone call to her friend Michaela, slumped over with a large amount of blood beneath the computer chair. It was obvious she had been shot in the back of the head at close range. Paramedics arrived shortly thereafter and did everything they could, but the gunshot had proven fatal and she was pronounced dead at the scene. Skyler had claimed to the police that he was taking the magazine out of his rifle when the gun hit his leg and caused it to go off, shooting Danielle in the process. He said he wasn't aware that there was a round in the chamber. This was again a different story to what he had told his neighbors. When asked again by another officer, he claimed he had shaken the rifle and it then discharged the gun. As he was being placed in the back of a police cruiser, he was notified that he was being audio and video recorded. Skyler started sobbing but not a single tear was observed. I'm not gonna do anything. Okay, just so you know, you're on camera, okay? Have you been advised of your Miranda rights? Mm -hmm. Okay, just hang tight, okay? <coughs> you. Oh my God. Oh my God. Why me? I love my wife so much. He seemed to be able to change emotion almost instantly, going from sorrow to yelling. Many who watched this video afterwards would comment that it appeared to be an act. Skyler was eventually brought in for questioning. Detectives would start asking him to give his story of the events that took place. I was behind her when she was on the computer. I, right before I said... Right before anything happened, I looked. I was just like watching. I looked over her shoulder and I was looking what she was doing, Peter. And I was like, you know, you're really cute. Or whatever. I told her, she, you know, you're being really cute right now because I just think it's cute when she works and stuff like that. And so I took the rifle and I, I took the magazine out. I took the magazine out and I, I, ch I don't know what the fuck happened. Like. I didn't charge it, I didn't pull the trigger or anything. I, I hit the safety, I turned the safety from safe to semi because I was about to charge it to make sure it was clear. Even though, when I gave it to her, I knew it wasn't around. So here, I think that when, maybe when I was gone, she might have put a round in the chamber maybe, not knowing what she was doing. And so, I don't know what the fuck, I, I did not pull the trigger and I didn't, the magazine was not on the weapon. I put the weapon on fire, it was on fire, so it had the probability of firing the weapon. And I don't know how the fuck it went off, but it went off. There were already inconsistencies from what he had told the neighbors to the other officers. And the more he talked, the more his story would change slightly. He had claimed, as he removed the magazine, that the rifle went off. And in a later version, claimed that the magazine wasn't even in the gun. As crime scene detectives began processing the scene, there were things that didn't quite make sense. Detectives now confronted Skyler. I really have no problem because your guys. story doesn't make sense. There's a huge fucking gap in your story. You're detailed all the way through up until the point where we had to talk to you for two and a half hours to get you to realize that we're smarter than you think and you shouldered a weapon because the fucking trajectory of that fucking round didn't match up. So immediately you changed the fucking story. That's about the eighth time you've done that. When your story, eight about eight times, when your story doesn't make sense and you hear it for the second time and we bring something up, you 
change the story. I'm trying to figure out why you put a gun to the back of your wife's head and pulled the trigger. Yet again, his story changes, and he comes up with a new version of events. Me firing the weapon, or me pulling the trigger, me pulling the trigger was not an accident, okay? Me, the, the, you know, I did not know there was a round in there. Her getting hit with that round, that was that, and I was not, it was an accident, and I was not mad, I was not angry. Okay, so tell me what happened. The, I was holding the weapon. I took the magazine out, okay? I was, for some reason, okay, I took the fucking magazine out, I put the weapon on fire, and I pulled the trigger. Police now began to try and establish a motive for as to why Skyler would do something like this. As it turns out, that information fell into the investigator's lap. Anthony Foss, who was one of Skyler's best friends in the U.S. Army, his wife, named Carrie Foss, walked into the police station to make a statement. She told a harrowing tale of Skyler subjecting Danielle to continual domestic abuse. It had become so bad that Danielle had to wear long sleeves to cover the bruises on her arms. Carrie had told investigators that Danielle had confided this information to her. Police had also found a receipt in the apartment for some roses. Carrie told police that Danielle, who was working at a granite county company at the time, had told her about her boss, Michael Newton, who she found attractive. She believes that there was no relationship between them other than work. Carrie also told police that the roses Danielle bought were given to her boss, Michael, who then passed them on to his wife. In return, Michael went and purchased the alcohol that Skyler had requested and gave it to Danielle. Skyler had previously found work messages between Danielle and her boss and believed they were having an affair. He was under the assumption that Anthony Foss had bought the alcohol for him. But when he found out that Danielle's boss, Michael, bought it, he was seething. Danielle had also told Carrie that while Skyler was away, she had caught up with an old friend by the name of Jeremy Henry. It is Carrie's belief that her husband Anthony may have seen the messages and told Skyler, adding to his paranoia. Police now spoke with Daniel's boss, Michael Newton. He confirmed the fact that their relationship was purely professional and only work-related. So did the relationship become more than just a working relationship? No, not at all. Okay. Um, I, we never did anything together whatsoever. The next person on the list to talk to was Daniel's friend, Jeremy Henry. He told police the last time he had seen Danielle was the previous Wednesday night. And have you had some contact with her in the last 10 months? Yes. Okay. I was actually at her house Wednesday night. On oh, Wednesday night? Yes, sir. Okay, did you spend the night that night? No. Okay. Okay, in the last three weeks while he was uh, in uh, Yakima in training, did you spend the night over there? Yes, sir. Okay. And how many times was that? I believe it was like two or three, sir. Well, which was it? I mean, you're not talking a long time ago. No, no, sir. I, might have been two two days. It was just like she was alone. She wanted somebody to talk to, watch me. Did you guys sleep in the same bed? No, sir. Did you have an intimate relationship? No, it's, you're not in trouble if you do. I mean, no. I mean, she's a pretty girl. I mean, no one would blame you if you did. I'm just saying, you know. But you had no relationship like that. No, did sir. she have an affair with anybody that you're aware of? No, you, you guys were really close friends. What about her new boss? No, sir. They just, it was all work. Yeah. Investigators now felt like they had put enough pieces of the puzzle together to bring a charge of first-degree murder against Skyler. There were many things that didn't add up in this case. After pointing the rifle at the back of his wife's head and pulling the trigger, Skyler did not call 911. Rather, his neighbors did. The neighbors also claimed it took Skyler several minutes to answer the door. Police had found that he quickly attempted to hide the balls of alcohol before police arrived at the residence, finding alcohol residue in the toilet. The history of abuse and domestic violence which he tried to cover up. Skyler was held in Pierce County Jail under a $1 million bond. When the bond amount was released, Skyler's mother Danette sold her house, car, and jewelry to pay for his bond. She also hired a leading defense attorney to represent Skyler. Over a year after his wife was tragically killed, Skyler Nemesis' trial would begin. The prosecution would present to the court an angry controlling individual who would consistently argue with Danielle. Prosecutors explained to the jury they found it hard to believe that a gun collector, builder, and a soldier in the US Army could make a fundamental mistake like pointing a gun at a loved one and pulling the trigger. One of the first lessons ever taught with a gun is always assume it is loaded. Extensive forensic weapon testing, including trigger pull analysis, had identified no faults with the gun. 
and gave no reason why it should have fired without someone intending it to be fired. Skyly was to take the stand now and answer questions from the prosecution. When asked about the events of that night, he told the same story as he did during his interrogation. He was asked why he didn't try to perform any medical aid to Danielle, and he simply said, I already knew she was dead. Skyler was also asked why instead of ringing 911 or trying to help his wife, he went and poured the alcohol down the toilet. For some stupid apparent reason, I thought alcohol needed to be poured out, which is it was completely stupid. I don't know why. If I could have done what I wanted, if I could go back and do what was right, I would have sat there and held her. And I would have prayed. And I wish I would have done that. I wish I would have held her. The prosecution now probed him about the blood evidence left in his apartment. You know, he left a considerable amount of blood at various locations within this apartment after you were injured, correct? I saw the pictures. Correct? Correct. That's when it happened, correct? Um, as far as I know, I did not realize, I did not see the injury until I was in my interrogation. And I know that because in my interrogation, I see myself looking at it. Did you just testify that you injured your finger in the firing of that weapon? Yes, I did. Okay. So we know that only after you fired the weapon, would you have left blood, a blood trail in that apartment, correct? Yes. All right. And among the areas that you left blood was what's called a spatter, I guess, technical term but a significant amount of blood around the door frame of your bedroom, correct? I believe so. Okay, and we also know that you left a smear on the top of the refrigerator in the kitchen, correct? Yes, I've seen that picture. Okay, and you also left a smear by the slider, correct? Yes, I've also seen that picture. And that would positively indicate areas that you went before you ever answered the door, correct? Yes, possibly. Possibly? Did you go to the slider after answering the door? Um, I do not remember. You don't remember? Yes, sir. Okay. You remember pulling the trigger? No, I do not. Don't remember that either. Prosecutors would argue that he spent so much time pouring out alcohol and moving around the apartment while neighbors were banging on his door that he never once considered helping his wife. Skyler's defense attorney would argue this claim and state that the killing of Danielle was unintentional and at worst, Skyler should receive a manslaughter charge. He would also argue that there was no premeditation to this tragic event. The jury took an entire week to come to a decision on the case. Skyler Nemitz was found guilty of manslaughter and not guilty of premeditated first-degree murder. The jury felt that prosecutors had not proven beyond a doubt that Skyler had intended to kill his wife, Danielle. He was sentenced to 13 and a half years of prison time for the crime. Skyler will be released in 2029. After the sentencing, Daniel's great aunt, Vera Schumard, was asked for her opinion on the case. Well, I'm somewhat disappointed, but I did leave this up to God, and this is what he came up with. So um, I think the attorneys uh, did a good job of presenting their case, and I think the jurors were interrupted too many times. And that might have had something to do with their thought process. And that wraps up today's case. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then check out one of these two other videos on screen that you may find interesting. We look forward to bringing you another worst case very soon.